One of my favorite numbers in mathematics is a very large counterexample to a famous conjecture about prime numbers. The conjecture is the Merton's conjecture and is related to the Riemann hypothesis. It starts with a simple question. Every number can be broken up into its prime factors. What we want to determine for each number is whether or not it has an even number or an odd number of prime factors. Take the number 35 for example. It can be written as a product of 5 and 7. And so it has an even number of primes. 42 can be written as a product of 3 primes. And so it has an odd number of prime factors. What about the number 52? Well, 52 has 2 prime factors, 2 and 13. Repeated prime factors don't really make a difference and for this reason they don't count. So the mathematician Franz Merton's, he was interested in this question, and in particular, he was interested in the way these numbers were distributed. And so to study the distribution, he created a function, now called the Merton's function. The Merton's function, m of n, is defined by counting all the numbers below n, with even prime factors, and subtracting all those without prime factors. Let's calculate m of 10 for example. We count every number from 1 to 10 and check if they have even or odd number of prime factors. Numbers with repeated factors are not included, so 4, 8 and 9 are not included. Numbers with even prime factors are 1, 6 and 10. 1 has 0 prime factors, and 0 is an even number. 2, 3, 5, and 7 are all prime, and they have 1 prime factor, so that's an odd number of prime factors. And so, 3 minus 4, Merton's function of 10, is negative 1. The Merton's function is usually written as a sum of another function, called the Mobius function. The Mobius function is defined in a similar way. It is 1 if there is an uneven number of prime factors, and negative 1 if there are an odd number of prime factors, and 0 it has a repeated prime factors. So the Merton's function is just a sum over the Mobius function. We can graph the Merton's function to look for patterns. And at first, it looks like there is no pattern at all. And this is what we might expect. After all, prime numbers appear random and unpredictable. However, if we look closer, there is actually a pattern. Although the numbers appear random, they appear to be bounded. What Merton's realized was that the value of the function could never get larger than the square root of n. It seems as though it was bounded by the square root of n. The function goes up and down, but could never get large enough to escape. And so Merton's conjectures that this would always be the case. We tried it for larger and larger values of n, and it seems as though it is true. But the really interesting thing is that there is a connection between this idea and the Riemann hypothesis. To see this, let's start out with the definition of the zeta function. Zeta of s is defined to be the sum of the reciprocal of all natural numbers, each raised to the power of s. At first, this seems like a simple sum with no relation at all to the prime numbers. But then, Euler shows us something remarkable. Consider multiplying the zeta function by 1 upon 2 to the s. Now instead of the sum of all numbers, we get the sum over all multiples of 2. So subtract this from the zeta function. On the right hand side, we will now have the sum over the odd numbers. And on the left hand side we have, we can factor zeta and get the product zeta 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s. So we can do the same thing for 3. And when we're done we would have removed all multiples of 3. We can do the same thing for 5, 7, 11 and all prime numbers. And when we're done, on the right hand side we have no multiples of prime left. So the only number left is 1. 
in the left hand side we have an infinite product involving prime numbers so Euler realized there was a way to write the zeta function as an infinite product involving primes so now we have that the reciprocal of the zeta function can be written as an infinite product involving prime numbers but something even more interesting happens when we try to expand this product into a sum now this is an infinite product so we can't expand it all at once however we know that each term must be a combination of the factors each factor is reciprocal of a prime number so each term is a product of these reciprocals and so every term involves a product of primes of course we can't ignore the negative signs a negative times a negative gives a positive in general the sign depends on the number of factors if we are an even number of factors then we have a positive sign and if there are an odd number of factors then we have a negative sign notice this is exactly the definition of the Mobius function notice also that you can't have repeated factors as each term is only used once if the Riemann hypothesis is true if the zeros on the zeta function lie in the real line one half then any polynomial n to the k where k is greater than one half must go faster than the Riemann zeta function so the Merton's conjecture clearly implies the Riemann hypothesis since the function cannot even go faster than k equals one half itself for a long time the Merton's conjecture was seen as a way to prove the Riemann hypothesis until the conjecture was disproved and it was disproved by showing that there had to be some large number which escapes from n equals 1 half. My favorite thing about this is that it is one of the greatest demonstrations of the fact that no matter for how many numbers you verify a pattern for it is never proof that this pattern will always hold. It just shows that it holds up to that point. And the Riemann hypothesis could have the same fate. We'll never know unless there's proof.